I think we are ready to go. Thank you very much. Welcome North American support group leaders and international affiliate leaders from across the entire globe. I'm Lisa Wise, Vice Chair of Information and Support and Chair of the IWMF Support Group. And I'm thrilled that every single one of you is joining us here today. Huge thanks to Michelle Posek, IWMF Manager of Information and Support, a truly invaluable resource and my dear partner in WM Crime. What an honor it is to extend my warmest thanks to Shirley Gantz, beloved Seattle support group leader and torch editor, who will be introducing our rock star doctors today, Dr. Libby and Dr. Kwok. Thanks so much for being such an active support group leader, Shirley. And I wanna turn it over to you and with all of our appreciation and thanks for, for joining us today. Thank you, Lisa. We're really happy that both these doctors can be with us. As we well know, they are certainly a part of our team and we appreciate the time they spend with us. So Dr. Ed Libby attended medical school at the University of Texas in Houston. He was trained in internal medicine and hematology at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Although his initial interests were in the diseases of clotting and bleeding, his career later evolved into that of a hematologist focused on the diagnosis and treatment of blood cancers. Dr. Libby joined the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and the University of Washington in 2011 to advance his research career. His practice and research focus are in the clinical trials for patients with multiple myeloma, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, and amyloidosis. Dr. Mary Kwok, completed her hematology and oncology fellowship training at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and was a clinical fellow with myeloma service at the National Cancer Institute. She then served as a staff hematologist oncologist at Walter Reed and continued as a clinical collaborator with the NCI. While at Walter Reed, she served as the hematology oncology fellowship training program director up at the National Capital Consortium. Her interests include global hematology, and she has worked with medical students from Albania for the past several years. She is board certified in hematology and medical oncology and is a clinician at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Welcome to the both of you and over to you. Mary, I think you were going to go first. Is that okay? Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And it's so nice to meet all of you um, from not only around the country, but it looks like internationally as well. So such a pleasure to be here. Um, I um, was going to give a talk on uh, Bing Nail Syndrome, which is <clears throat> kind of a rare um, uh, manifestation of Waldenstrom's. I can't, oh. Here we go, share screen. Sorry, let me just share my screen here. Perfect. Does that look okay? Fabulous. Okay, great. Um, so um, um, I don't know if uh, you've ever met anyone with Bing-Neal syndrome. I will say that it's very, very uncommon, um, but it's something that can happen in patients with Waldenstrom's. And so I thought that might be interesting to talk about today. I thought that I would start by a case. Um, this is a case that I saw prior to coming to the SECA um, and that one of our residents wrote up as a case report. And so the reference is there. But this was a 71 year old gentleman um, who was diagnosed with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Um, he had been observed for the initial three years and then eventually developed symptoms that required um, treatment. And he was treated with bendamustine and rituximab for six cycles. With that, his IgM um, came down really nicely, his cytopenia was resolved and he like clinically had a remission. But then a few weeks, uh, excuse me, a few months later, he presented with progressive gait abnormalities and falls. Um, he was uh, evaluated for like more common causes for what we call syncope, like passing out episodes through, you know, cardiac evaluation and blood pressure monitoring and stuff like that. And all that came back normal, um, but he was found to have weakness in his lower extremities, like especially the proximal muscles. So like the thigh muscles were really weak on him. Um, when 
observing his gait, his gait was very unsteady. And then when checking for sensation, he had diminished sensation below the knees. And then also what we call decreased propriosc proprioception. So like when you close your eyes and you know, kind of know where you are in space, um, that was his proprioception was diminished. And then also his ability to um, uh, notice vibration was also diminished. And so this was really concerning. His labs at that time showed that his IgM level had not increased actually, it was still very low at 248. Um, but uh, a lumbar puncture was performed and then the spinal fluid studies showed that he had elevated IgM levels, elevated beta two microglobulin, I'm sorry for the typo there, microglobulin levels. And more importantly, there were cells in the spinal fluid that, showed, that were similar to the cells that were found in his bone marrow biopsy with his initial diagnosis of Waldenstrom. So what we call the lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma cells. He also had imaging um, that included a brain MRI. And this is a picture of his brain images. Um, the red arrows help guide you to the areas of abnormality that were identified. And so these areas that are bright and white here are sites of what we call leptomeningeal enhancement. Um, uh, so brightening of the covering of the, um, of the brain that shows areas that were concerning for involvement by Waldenstrom's. And so putting this all together with the cells that were found on his spinal fluid and then this MRI finding and his symptoms, um, this was felt to be consistent with Bing-Neal syndrome. So that begs the question, what is Bing-Neal syndrome? So Bing-Neal syndrome um, uh, is a syndrome that occurs when these lymphoma cells, the lymphoplasmacytic cells, start to infiltrate the brain or spinal cord, or what we call the central nervous system, causing neurological defects. And um, uh, when we look at the descriptions of Bing-Neal syndrome, the symptoms that patients present with really, really vary. More commonly, um, there's a balance disorder or some sort of gait disorder that's been described in about half of the patients. Um, there is um, cranial nerve involvement um, that can occur, such as facial or oculomotor nerve palsy. Um, there can be ocular symptoms, so people will describe decreased um, visual acuity or blurry vision. Sometimes there's cognitive impairment, which is, I, personally, I think a little bit hard to kind of um, describe, you know, especially since so many patients describe feeling like brain fog and things like that, especially when they're on treatment, or there might be altered mental status, like changes in personality and, you know, de decreased memory, things like that. Headaches have been described, and then sensory deficits, so um, decreased ability to notice, you know, touch and feel um, has, all of these symptoms have been described. So you can see they're kind of um, very varied in the spectrum of symptoms. The way that it's described is that we, uh, when patients are first diagnosed with Bing-Neal syndrome, they find that the symptoms are typically gradually progressive in nature. So they've noticed that their symptoms have kind of come on over weeks to months. Um, you might notice that some of these symptoms that I just talked about are symptoms that are um, described in other things, such as IgM-related peripheral neuropathies, whether it's anti-mag neuropathy or neuropathy that um, is associated with the Waldenstrom's itself, or even hyperviscosity syndrome, like when we talk about the vision changes and things like that. <clears throat> and so I, I just wanted to point out that Bing-Neal syndrome is a distinct entity from the peripheral neuropathy or the hyperviscosity, although they too can coexist at the same time. And so what might help us distinguish between the the other um, entities. So for instance, for an IgM related neuropathy, typically we expect to see symmetrical length dependent sensory deficits. So that means the further you are away from the heart is where your symptoms start and that you would expect to see symptoms symmetrically like on the right and left side. Um, if it's asymmetric, that might kind of make us think, oh, could there be something like big meal going on? Hyperviscal, <laughs> excuse me. Hyperviscosity syndrome um, usually doesn't only cause vision changes. So if there are concomitant symptoms of nose bleeding, headaches, and things like that, that might also kind of clue us into the fact that this is hyperviscosity syndrome. Um, 
Bing Neal syndrome and Walden syndromes in general is just really fascinating to me because they were syndromes and um, diagnoses that were described ba based on very small numbers of patients. So interestingly enough, Bing Neal syndrome was a syndrome that was um, described by Dr. Bing and Dr. Neal in 1936 after they had two patients with macroglobulinemia or hyper hyper um, where there were neurological de deficits. Interestingly, it was described eight years prior to the time that Dr. Waldenstrom described Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, which was also described after seeing two patients with very similar symptoms. And so just kind of a fun fact there. But the question is, is or more relevant, like how often does this happen, right? And it's important to know that bing Neal syndrome is very, very rare. It occurs in only about 1% of patients with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And Waldenstrom's in and of itself is a very, very rare diagnosis. I think the last number that I saw was around 1,400 cases per year or three cases per million patients in the United States. So of the, that rare cancer, it's a very rare entity. Um, but what, when do we think about it, right? We can think about it anytime someone is diagnosed with Waldenstrom. So it can actually be the initial manifestation of Waldenstrom's. Um, there was a paper that was described describing the median time from the identification of an MGUS to bing Neal syndrome was four years. Um, and that bing Neal syndrome was the initial manifestation of Waldenstrom's. It can happen after someone's initially treated, like this patient that I just described. Um, uh, based on the cases reported, the median time from the diagnosis of Waldenstrom's to the onset of Bing Neal was almost nine years. And the other thing is, it can occur in the absence of systemic disease. So if the lymph nodes and the bone marrow and the IgM levels are all under control, we can still see Bing Neal syndrome appear. And so um, this is why it's something that it's really important to think about, right? And so how do we diagnose Bing Neal syndrome? We, we should have a clinical suspicion so this will prompt us to look for it. And SPEP and immunofixation is helpful to know, you know, is there an associated IgM gammopathy, um, especially if someone doesn't have a pre-existing diagnosis. And then some form of imaging, MRI, um, with and without contrast of the brain and the spine. So looking at the whole entire central nervous system and then some sort of tissue. So probably the least invasive way to do this is with a lumbar puncture where we get um, CSF or cerebral spinal fluid analysis. We can do cytology and sometimes see the um, LPL cells there. Flow cytometry will give us a signal um, for the um, characteristics of these cells. And then we can look for, um, uh, on a molecular level, if there are any abnormalities that kind of help confirm that diagnosis. The gold standard though, would be to do some sort of tissue biopsy. So a brain biopsy or a biopsy of the meninges, but obviously this is more invasive. And so if we, if we could get to the diagnosis in a less invasive way, that is always preferred. Um, these are some of the patterns that might be seen on an MRI. So um, about 80% of the time when someone is diagnosed with bing Neal syndrome, we'll see this leptomeningeal involvement. And this is just that same picture that I showed you earlier of the patient with just a little bit of enhancement um, on the lining of the surface of the brain. That's called leptomeningeal enhancement. Or you could see actual brain mass or parenchymal involvement. Um, so this is not on the surface, as you can see, it's within the brain itself manifesting as masses. This is less common, seen about 20% of the time. Um, the thing with um, bing Neal syndrome is there's no like uh, what we call pathognomonic or there's no clear pattern that says clearly this is bing Neal syndrome. We have to have a level of clinical suspicion, the right clinical scenario, the imaging findings, and then tissue that show us that um, that's the case. Once we make the diagnosis, how do we treat somebody that has bing Neal syndrome, right? So generally if someone's symptomatic, and if I had to guess if they're having this evaluation, they're probably symptomatic, treatment is needed. And um, as of now, there's no standard approach to the treatment of bing Neal syndrome. And then just like with Waldenstrom's, that's not, the goal is not to cure the Waldenstrom's, right? Because we don't have that. The goal is really to control the symptoms and to make people's neurological symptoms feel better. So how do we choose those therapies? We have to choose therapies that penetrate the 
blood brain barrier that protects the brain and spinal cord. And not all of our chemotherapies effectively get across that barrier. And so the things that we have access to are intrathecal chemotherapy, and that's when chemotherapy is directly inserted into the spinal fluid, radiation therapy, and then some of the chemotherapies that at certain doses can penetrate the blood brain barrier much better. Um, now, in modern eras, we have um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors like BTK inhibitors, BCL2 inhibitors like venetoclax and things like this that are small molecules that do seem to effectively cross that blood brain barrier. Um, this is a paper that came out from 2017. It was made by the um, International Walter Strums Foundation as a um, in their like consensus on how to approach patients with Bing-Neal syndrome. And here they talk about all the different kinds of therapies that have been described. Um, and a lot of them are the chemotherapy-based treatments like I just mentioned. Interesting um, that high-dose chemotherapy, so high-dose methotrexate, plus minus rituximab, plus minus stem cell transplant yielded quite high responses in terms of complete responses. So response rates of about 70 months with a median progression-free survival. So before the symptoms come back again of 18 months. Um, this is a slightly more um, uh, recent um, paper that was written by Dr. Castillo and Dr. Um, Trion from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute on how they would recommend managing Bing-Neal syndrome. So first you make the diagnosis of Bing-Neal syndrome, you get the imaging of the brain and spine, and then you find the cells in the CSF. If someone's asymptomatic, they recommend observation. But if somebody's symptomatic, they recommend treatment. And as of 2019, the rec preferred treatment was ibrutinib. And then other options are the chemotherapy like we had just mentioned. Um, we can use rituximab plus minus if desirable or radiation or intrathecal chemotherapy. So again, that delivery of chemotherapy straight into the cerebral spinal fluid, um, potentially as an alternative, depending on the clinical scenario. And then we continue treatment to, to response, right? Um, understanding that anytime we have a medication that penetrates the CNS, there are also risks for side effects in the CNS, whether it's intrathecal chemotherapy or radiation, et cetera. Um, regarding the prognosis, which is a question that patients sometimes wanna know and sometimes prefer not to know, um, it's hard to say exactly because the, there's really, really limited data. Um, this is a very rare um, uh, finding, you know, in patients with Waldenstrom's. And so uh, there are small, like, reports of uh, cases. Um, the survival rates vary, right, with five-year overall survival. So how many people are alive five years from their diagnosis of being Neal? per this paper from Simon et al. was described at 70%. A paper by Dr. Castillo et al. Um, described that at three years, 60% of people with big male syndrome are still living. And so the numbers are not totally consistent. And then we also understand that when there's increased therapy options that these numbers might not hold today. Um, we do think that outcomes are better in patients who have not been heavily pretreated prior to their diagnosis of big male who are younger and had um, more robust bone marrow um, function based on platelet counts greater than 100. So I just wanted to circle back to uh, this patient that was described in this case. Um, this patient actually started ibrutinib 560 milligrams daily. And then within a first week of therapy had significant improvement of his weakness, his gait and ambulation. And then his MRI um, two months after starting ibrutinib showed improvement. So this area of enhancement here is all gone. Unfortunately, he developed side effects related to the ibrutinib therapy and eventually developed severe sepsis and a C. diff infection, leading to um, re resection of his bowel. Um, and because of this like very, very complicated hospital course, he was off the ibrutinib for six to eight weeks. And then what happened was this patient developed progressive altered mental status, and then he had a repeat brain MRI that showed left meningeal enhancement. However, even after this progression, he was able to resume the ibrutinib once he was more clinically stable. And then a repeat, repeat brain MRI three months after resuming ibrutinib showed complete resolution of the leptomeningeal enhancement. So this is very encouraging that even if there's progression after stopping the ibrutinib that he still responded. I don't know how he's doing now. I've left um, my previous hospital for over a year now, and um, but I'm 
optimistic um, that you know he's had a good response. Um, and that just brings me to the end. Um, I know that Dr. Libby will um, give his presentation after, and we're happy to take any questions. Uh, please feel free to reach out anytime. Dr. Kwok, thank you so much. That was wonderful. We're so grateful to you um, for that uh, for that very helpful overview. And um, I just wanted to um, take a moment now. Is it okay if we just take like one minute in between presentations? Yeah, of course. Is that okay with you, Doc? Okay. Um, because I wanted to introduce um, all of us on this call are, uh, are WMers and support group leaders um, so that we help uh, coordinate all of the wonderful, right now, virtual support groups around the world. And um, uh, I know I have someone with Bing Neal in my support group. I'm, I'm sure many others here have that as well. We have a very special opportunity, though, to hear right now from Eileen Sullivan. Eileen is a support group leader in Massachusetts, and she actually um, is, is the founding member of our the IWMF's first specialty support group, which was the Bing Neal support group. Oh, wow. um, and so we have an international Bing Neal support group, which meets um, with some frequency. And I wanted to ask Eileen to take a moment to talk to us now before we transition um, to transformation with Dr. Libby, if that's okay, to just hear a little bit about the um, IWMF Bing Neal support group and um, what, what's, uh, what it's been like getting that up uh, off the ground. And if any of us have Bing Neal patients within our own support groups, we can certainly offer to them to meet with this wonderful group because it's really nice to be in the same room at the same time with a lot of people who are struggling with similar symptoms as you, as we all know. Eileen, are you ready to share? Absolutely. A thank oh, you so thanks, much, friend. Lisa. Yeah, thank you so much. We um, we actually uh, I've been I've been living in the Bing Neal world most of the week because we have our next support group meetings coming up this weekend, and so the link has been put out in the Waldenstrom's Weekly several times. Um, and you do need to pre-register for the meeting. So we have two different um, we have two different times that we're using in order to accommodate time zones um, because we have people from you know the West Coast and East Coast, and we have people from Australia. So we have a, a meeting at uh, noon Eastern time and another meeting at seven Eastern time. So this got started a couple of months ago, a year ago, I can't even remember. Uh, we have in Massachusetts, I have at least three uh, support group members who happen to have Bing Neal. And so um, their stories are all, as Dr. Kwok was saying, are all very different from one another. You know, one has a brain tumor, the other one noticed it a post diagnosis with gait problems and confusion, that sort of thing. And so it just seemed like a good idea to uh, for them to be able to get together with more folks. So we did a large meeting last year, um, and we were fortunate to have both doctors, uh, Dr. Trion and Dr. Castillo, speak. And that um, the recording of that meeting is available. It's not on the IWMF website yet, but we've just realized that, and Maureen will be correcting that. Right now, it's on the IWMF YouTube channel, so it's easy to find. Um, and we're going to, we're not having a major presentation at this upcoming meeting, but Dr. Castillo was kind enough to record like a 15 minute update on uh, treatment ideas and treatment options. And as Dr. Kwok said, they are recommending ibrutinib, that is their first line of treatment right now for people with Bing Neal. So, um, so we have a little video that we're going to be showing and then we're going to be able to put people in breakout rooms so that they can chat in smaller groups with folks with Bing Neal. And right now, I think we have about 50 people signed up <clears throat> for the meetings, between the two meetings. So given, given the, the tiny percentage of people of Wal with Waldenstrom's who have that, it will be very nice to be able to accommodate that many people who can then meet each other. Eileen, thank you so much for spearheading that, for doing mm -hmm. that, and all the work that you do with your own support group in Massachusetts. Right, right. We're so grateful to you for your leadership and for really leading the way in specialty support groups, which um, uh, really uh, forged a path ahead for things like the peripheral neuropathy support group, which we have a whole bunch of our co-leader, you know, our planning committee that works on that here today, um, Joel and Steve and Jane and Bob, all of you can give a, a wave and a shout out. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> 
one more but thing you were the I first. just thought of. Lisa. You were the first, Eileen. Yes, and one then Dr. Thing. Libby's ready to rock and roll. Okay, never mind. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead oh, before we zip into transformation. Let's hear. Um, so I'm, I'm actually at this point sort of backing away from the Bing Neal support group. I'm really functioning more these days as technical support Great. because um, Julie Davidson, who is the uh, uh, Lifeline volunteer from Arizona, uh, Peter Fries from Australia and Stuart Quick from the UK are really going to be the uh, key players moving forward. So it's really wonderful because I don't have Big Neil. They all do. And so it's nice for them to be able to really interact with folks. So I'm glad I'm, that you I'm mentioned Zoom that. Support. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that, Eileen, because guys, I wanted to just bring Eileen on for a minute to pop on because um, let this be a model for us. If you're in a support group meeting and you hear that there's a need and there's patients who have something that they would like to get together with other patients to discuss, and you think, hey, wouldn't it be great if we got a specialty group together where they could you know, explore this and we could invite an expert doctor to unpack it with them and just have one meeting, maybe see where it goes, go for it, you know, talk to Shelly and I, we'll make it happen with you. It happened with Bing Neal, it can happen with so much more in WM. So without further ado, Dr. Libby, thank you so much for your patience. We're so excited to hear what you have to say about um, this very hot topic um, of transformation, which I know many of us have a lot of questions about. So we're looking forward to a rich Q&A as well. So I better shut up so you can jump in there. Take it away, Dr. Libby. Can you hear me now? Perfectly. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to share screen. Uh, I hope. Let's see here. Let's see. I don't know. Okay, so I don't know what you're seeing. We're seeing the your Zoom screen. Okay, my apologies. Um, so, but. Let me uh, pause share and, okay, new share. Let's try it, let's see. Let's see if this thing is up, it's up. So. When you mouse to the bottom of your screen, I did see um, your PowerPoint pop up though. Um, okay, go. I don't see it here yet. I'm doing something wrong. My no, don't worry. Shelly saw it. And uh, Dr. Libby, we might just ask you um, to increase your volume if you don't mind. Some folks are having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Okay. It could let's, be because I'm talking over you. Yeah, let's find this thing first. Yes, uh, one thing at a time. Uh, show windows. Oh, I see. Further. There it is. Okay. Thank you. And we'll. Okay, so is can you see that now? Not yet. You cannot see my picture yet. No. Okay. Um, there we go. Uh, but now you went out of your old. It might have been just a matter of going out and coming back into the screen share. Let's see. Oh, that looks good. There's a cute cartoon. Okay, cartoon is good. Now, um, let's see. See, there's my microphone and uh, we're done with that. Go away. That's okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so <laughs> camera, go back to mute. So test speaker. Okay, I may have to yell. How is that? Oh, no, I think you're okay. I, th I think you were, I think it was a little bit. Is it better, folks? Does anybody want to throw in the chat? Oh, test, test, test. Sounds better. Okay. All right. So here's the screen. I'm sorry to fool around with the audio visuals. I will speak loudly. If I'm too loud, please let me know. Uh, no, folks are saying louder the better. I'm getting some chats telling, asking me to, yeah, as loud as, yeah. I don't know why the volume would be down. It's a, it's a problem on our end. Oh. Uh, oh, here we go. Let's do one more thing now. Give me one more chance to redeem myself. <laughs> oh, you're already redeemed with this group. Uh, so microphone 
is uh, maybe I'll. Okay, how is that? Sounds great to me. Okay, I'm going to go with that. Uh, okay, so as you may or may not know, first of all, thank welcome from around, for all of you around the world. I'm really impressed with uh, the number of people and the different countries and places that are represented. I'm thrilled to be able to share what I know about this disease with you and to get feedback from you and, and to learn from you as well. I am going to retire in the near future, uh, although I won't be disappearing entirely from hematology and this uh, depicts my, my very near future, the end of December. Uh, and it's been uh, spectacular being involved in the care of patients with uh, diseases like Waldenstrom's. I've always been fascinated with rare diseases and I'm, I'm very pleased that Dr. Kwok is too. So, uh, Let's see here. Uh, hang on, okay, darn it. Almost there. Come on, Dr. Libby. I know we started at the end. I see, we started at the end. So let's begin at the beginning. Uh, now, can you, let's get this back up. Darn it, Dr. Libby. There we go. Let's, one more thing add. Okay, okay, this is looking very promising. Excellent. Okay. We got it. it. So this was supposed to be the beginning. And so this is actually a, a cartoon of myself and my significant other. And I, I actually used to play the drums, but I, 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 uh, it, I'm I, sure a lot of people want, in my family were miserable with it. But I am going to, I have been playing the guitar and I'm going to continue to try and uh, wring some horrible sounds out of my guitar. So that's part of my retirement plans. Anyway, okay, let's see if it will forward please. Aha, yes. We're going to talk about transformation. And like Mary said uh, about Bing Neal, these are unusual complications. 1% is low, and we'll talk about the percentage in, in transform, but these are unusual, uncommon complications. But I, uh, I think it's worth knowing about them in case uh, you can help other people who happen to get it. And also for yourself, just being aware that these things can happen. They generally don't, but they can. So what is transformation in Waldenstrom's? And I like this picture because it's uh, really in some ways depicts what happens. You go from being, I probably would like to see a little infant here, which would really be my representation of Waldenstrom's. It's a very much, much of the time, most of the time it's a mild disease. Yes, it's a cancer, but it's a very mild cancer for most patients. And that's why you hear doctors say silly things like, well, if you have to have a cancer, this is the one you want to have. You know, that makes some patients angry and, I, you know, that's a bad thing to say. And I, I agree, but this is a mild cancer and should be really over here on the far left. Um, but the disease occasionally will turn into a similar, but not exactly the same disease that is very aggressive. And that's this, you know, the Hulk here on the far right. So it's something to be aware of. I'm not, don't wanna warn you about it. I just want you to be aware of it. Now, what is transformation in Waldenstrom's? And by the way, this also occurs in other lymphomas like Waldenstrom. So the most common Waldenstrom's is WM, is an indolent lymphoma. You've heard, probably heard your physician use that term before. Indolent meaning sleepy, mild, easy to treat, tends not to cause a lot for trouble compared to a lot of other lymphomas. So Waldenstrom's is an indolent lymphoma and a close relative of Waldenstrom's is a disease called follicular lymphoma, far, far more common. So follicular can do this. Other, there are other indolent lymphomas that can do this too. So transformation is when the cells of your cancer, of the, the WM cells, change, they transform, they evolve to a much more aggressive lymphoma. So it's not like, it's not apples turning into oranges, but it's one type of apple turning into a different type of apple. And uh, uh, so it, 
it's still very closely related to what to the WM, but it is a different blood cancer. Pretty amazing thing. Pretty pretty weird uh, in my mind. So transformation occurs in different indolent lymphomas and in Waldenstrom's because it's an indolent. And what it usually transforms into is a disease called diffuse large B cell lymphoma, abbreviated as DLBCL. Um, and this is a very common form of lymphoma. When it's, tra when, when it's transformed DLBCL, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, it's pretty darn aggressive and hard to treat. So this is a w uncommon, I'm not gonna say rare, but well-known complication of Waldenstrom's. And your, your doctor should be at least have it in the back of their mind whenever they're seeing you, particularly if you're sick. And so a study from the Bing Center in, at Dana-Farber uh, by Dr. Castillo looked at out of 1,466 patients they had in their database, they had 20 people who'd had transformation. These were, and so they reported on this fairly recently. And so all of the patients transformed to diffuse large B cell, meaning you can turn into something other than diffuse large B cell lymphoma or DLBCL. But in, in, the, in this particular study, everybody turned into that particular type of lymphoma. So if you transform, that's what you're usually gonna see is diffuse large B cell. Um, the median, the average time from the time you, patients were diagnosed with Waldenstrom's to transformation was for a little bit more than four years. But when you can, you can be transform, have transformation when you're diagnosed. It can occur at any time. It's kind of like being needle. Um, the incidence, when this word histological just means that under the microscope, the, w, the Waldenstrom cells, the WM cells, look like a different cancer. They look like diffuse large B cell. So the microscopic, the, the microscopic incidence of transformation was 1% at five years. So less than 1% a year, 0.2% um, per year, 2.5% at 10 years, and at 15 years, um, almost one out of 25 patients had had it in their study, had transformed. So it's Depends on how you define rare. It's uncommon. It definitely happens. And I think for it's valuable to be aware of it, both your oncologist and yourself. These are the symptoms, uh, some findings in patients uh, who were diagnosed uh, with transformation. So they were standard age, 60 to 70, 40 to 75 total. The average age was 70. Um, the majority of them were male, but that's true for the disease anyway. Um, what's important here, the, the elevated LDH levels there in the middle of the slide, that's important. So LDH is a measurement of lymphoma activity. And many of us <laughs> check it routinely when we're seeing patients with lymphoma, patients with WM. It goes up when lymphoma starts to turn on. And so majority of these patients, two out of three had elevated LDHs. Um, the majority, 84%, had, uh, well, had, had the, transformain, the, the transformed lymphoma outside of the lymph nodes. The majority of them had advanced stage three or four lymphoma, diffuse large B cell. And as you can see, the average number of patients that had just one treatment. So it's not necessarily the more treatments you get, the more likely you are to transform. Some of them even had had no treatments. And just a list there of the various treatments people had had. How do we treat transformation? I do want to say something before. Let's just go back here if I can. Oh, thank you, computer, uh, for behaving. So what I usually tell patients is if you suffer a transformation, you're usually going to be sick. So it's not, it will be silent at first and you won't know the, the day that your cells evolve or change into diffuse large B cell, you're not gonna know that day. But pretty quickly you'll start to have, most patients have uh, classic symptoms of active lymphoma. And classic symptoms are often what we call B symptoms, B like boy in cancer. And a B symptom would be fevers, chills, night sweats weight loss for no reason, um, 
uh, lymph nodes suddenly appearing in your armpits or your, or your neck, that's not a B symptom, but fever, chill, sweats, weight loss, common for B symptoms. You could suddenly say, wow, I have this lymph node in my col uh, above my collarbone. And, and last week it seemed smaller than this week, or it's in my armpit and it seems to be growing pretty rapidly. Um, I just feel sick. I feel awful. I'm weak. Um, that you will often feel ill when you can develop transformations. A little bit different from Waldstrom's where people are often not that sick. Maybe they're a little anemic, but they're not really sick by that definition. So be aware that's one thing to keep an eye out for. Um, it's just feeling really, really sick that you should just worry if you're a WM doctor, worry about transformation in your patient. So how do we treat transformation? So patients, a uh, patient with WM gets ill, sort of classically becomes actually quite ill, loses weight, new lymph nodes popping up all over the place, high fevers. Well, we check an LDH, we check a CT scan, the LDH is high. The CT scan shows a whole bunch of new lymph nodes, big lymph nodes often. Well, it need, you need to treat with chemotherapy. Um, so, and because it's a different cancer, so it's a related but different blood cancer, diffuse large B cell usually, we use treatments that are quite different from what we usually use in WM. So we use diffuse large B cell treatments. Remember I said that diffuse large B cell is extremely common lymphoma, the most common lymphoma actually. So cancer doctors see it all the time and, and treat it all the time. And some of the classic chemos that have been used are what's called RCHOP, our EPOC, each of those letters, of course, stands for a different chemo. So here's a five drug combination. Rituximab is in it. Here's a, here's a five, uh, a six drug combination, including rituximab. This is, and these are the treatments that were delivered in that study. Um, some patient, one patient got ice, which is a treatment that we give before we do a stem cell transplant. One patient uh, got the, the diffuse large B cell went to their central nervous system that's not big meal because it's a different type of lymphoma and they got high dose methotrexate. And a significant number of people, so three out of four, did get a complete remission from frontline treatment, very encouraging. One out of three got a stem cell transplant. So it's frequently done as well in patients who have transformation. So we're using aggressive chemo, much more Powerful, I think is a fair word, and more toxicities than what we usually use in Waldenstrom's. This is for transformation. And um, so this is uh, survival probability in transformation, and, and this is not good news. So transformed lymphomas in Waldenstrom's, and the same thing is true if you have the other common indolent lymphoma I mentioned, the more common indolent lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, if you transform, the news is not good. Uh, the disease is very aggressive and it's not the same wonderful story that we have for many patients with Waldenstrom's. Patient's lifespan is shortened. So you can see here that at, at five years, roughly maybe 40% of patients are still alive at five years and at 10 years, about one in four patients is still alive. And you can see that patients die pretty rapidly uh, with transformation. That's because this is a really aggressive disease. Um, so it's scary. It's, it's not something I want you to have. Um, another way of looking at this is the, here's another of survival. This is survival in comparing survival in Waldenstrom's which is this bluish black line up here to survival in patients. The red dotted line is what happens to patients who transform. And you can, and so this line is quite a bit lower than this line. And so the survival, as I just showed you in a different manner, survival is significantly less if you have transformation. The survival in Waldenstrom's here is a beautiful, nice long curve and even out at 10 years, about three out of four people are still alive with Wallenstrom's. It's a beautiful, lovely, happy curve. I wish it was even higher, but this curve is telling us, and this is out of date, you know, it's, it was published a few years ago, but even at that time, at 10 years out, the average Wallenstrom, in the average Wallenstrom's patient, three out of four people are still alive. 
not true if you get transformation in there. It's, it's a negative thing. It's not a good thing to happen. So I think this is perhaps my last slide. My talk is pretty short and compact, but this is an overview of how in our center and, and one paper presented the approach to treating indolent lymphoma that transforms. So remember Waldenstrom's WM is a member of the indolent lymphoma family, the milder lymphomas. So uh, if somebody with WM has never been treated, maybe you were just watching them and their IgMs were elevated, but they were feeling fine. They never got any chemo and suddenly boom, they're sick, their LDH is high, lymph nodes are popping up everywhere. They're having fevers, chills and sweats. They're losing weight. Wow, they have, you biopsy and you see that it's a new lymphoma, it's diffuse large B cell. So in people who've never been treated, we do standard treatments that we would use for diffuse large B cell, our chop. Um, or something, our CHOP is very standard routine chemo given all day long in any chemo suite because diffuse large B cell is so common. So if you've never been treated, we keep it pretty simple. You could do more aggressive chemo than our CHOP. This is uh, chemo immunotherapy. So you could do something more aggressive, but often if you've never been treated and you transform, we give you our CHOP and depends on how you do. Um, Now, if you had been if you had been previously treated for your, for Waldenstrom's and you develop a transformation, the first thing we in our center what we'd want to do, and we tend to agree with this, is if you had not received RCHOP type therapy, is we'd want to give you RCHOP type therapy. Um, I think what this is saying, uh, th this I'm sorry, th I'm splitting this up. Um, I misread this a little bit. Uh, let me go back to the top for a second. So if at diagnosis you have uh, transformation, um, you would get RCHOP. If you were treatment naive and you transformed, uh, you would get RCHOP. If you uh, had been treated before and you had RCHOP and you develop a transformation, then we're going to recommend a stem cell transplant. So patients who've been treated with RCHOP type therapy and get a transformation, we're then going to suggest uh, an autologous stem cell transplant using your own stem cells. Um, uh, and that's sort of the short answer here. Um, and what this is saying, the very last one here is saying, okay, you say all you had was rituximab or you'd had a brutinib and you develop a transformation, but you've never had RCHOP we would suggest getting our CHOP first. So basically what this is telling us is the first thing to do in transformation is make sure the patient has had a chemotherapy or therapy regimen like our CHOP. And that's because in, that, in those regimens is something called an anthracycline or doxorubicin. So we wanna make sure first of all that you get an anthracycline. If you haven't had one, we would give you our CHOP. If you have, then we would move right on to a transplant. So, Transformation um, is uh, a, something you don't want to happen. Unfortunately, there is a real chance of it happening, you know, up to, I think what we were seeing is 20, 15% at 15 years, something like that. So it can happen. I, I, it's too common for me to call it rare. And you and your, your oncologist should be aware of it, just like really your oncologist, whoever's treating you with WM, should know what Bing Neal is, uh, and they should probably have heard of transformation. Uh, with Bing Neal, if, if you have a bad headache that's on, different from anything you've ever had before, or you're having brain symptoms, whoever your doctor is should be aware that Waldenstrom's can go to your brain. If you suddenly become really ill and you're acting like you've got, uh, you're losing a bunch of weight, you're very sick and they're not sure why, they should be thinking, could this be transformation? Fortunately, neither of most patients suffer from either of these complications, but you can, and that's why we thought it would be interesting to bring them up. Now we've already been here, so um, we'll be glad and delighted to answer questions.
Dr. Libby, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. thank you for ending ending with that positive uh, slide because- that's the, that's the point of this slide. That's here. I, I don't want you to worry about this. Just be aware of it. You know, yeah. yes, anything can happen and just be aware of this. I don't want to scare people. It's just interesting information. I'm so grateful to you, Dr. Libby. Thank you so much for that. And um, oh, thank you for stopping the screen show. Then we can see everybody's faces. Um, I I feel like we uh, could have called this meeting into the woods because uh, we, you know, are always hear about WM complications and some of the darker sides, the more the scarier pieces. And it's often hard um, when we have an indolent disease like this, where you want to be up to Eden optimistic to venture into really understand what are these complications about and what do we need to know about them? And how do we hold the awareness of them without also holding the anxiety of every morning? Do I have that too? You know, mm -hmm. so it's really a delicate balance. And as you know, you're really a fan favorite with the WM community, who better to talk to us about something really super scary uh, than the two of you. So we're so grateful both to you, Dr. Kwok, and to Dr. Libby um, for coming today. And knowing that you were going to retire, we knew this was, we, we had to get last dibs in. We had to grab you before you went anywhere to be sure that our um, community of leaders would, uh, volunteer leaders would be able to um, uh, uh, enjoy you today. Yes, well, I'm getting messages that your screen share is still active. This is true. Let's see if I can. Oh, and then it's gone. Of course, Shelly would jump in there and do something magical. Thank Thanks, Shelly. Um, would it be okay if we threw a couple of questions here at you and um, took a little bit more of your time here? We, is that good I'm for you I'm clockwise? I'm certainly free for another half an hour. 50 or so. minutes or so. Oh, fantastic. We won't even take that long, but we did get some pre-submitted questions. Um, and I just wanted to go ahead, jump in there with them. And then if people have questions then that we can throw them in the chat and we'll be sure to get you on your way in a timely uh, manner. Um, you know, about 15 minutes or so, if that's okay, a little 20. Oh, oh brilliant. So um, we have a lot of young WMers joining the IWMF, which is, is really one of our goals is to get to people um, as early as possible and let them know about the IWMF. And we've started a new young WMer support group. Um, which is really exciting because when you hop on their support group, they are a whole bunch of fresh scrub, little baby face people. It's shocking. It doesn't look like your, your typical WM community. Sorry, everybody, all of us who are looking a little worn out. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, so what question, the first question we got is what is the frequency of transformation in younger WM patients? Does transformation need time in order to happen? We saw the mean there of uh, almost nine years, I think, eight point something. Um, I'm just curious about younger patients. I, as far as I know, there's no difference. I think because of its rarity in, in say 30 and 40 year olds, there's no study to tell us this, to answer this question. But um, there's, uh, I, I don't, there's not been any hints in the literature that it's different. Um, so I, I think, yes, what, what this, your question may be leading up to is, okay, I'm 40 years old and I have WM. That means I'm hopefully I'm going to live 40 more years. Is my risk in the long run higher? And I'd say, without any research to prove this, yes, yes. So it, now, uh, of course, every year that we go, there's better and better and better treatments for everything. So the chances, uh, uh, yes, you're you're because you will in all likelihood live a lot longer than somebody who's 70. Um, your your overall risk is going to be higher because of the length of time you'll have the disease. That's my educated guess. Yeah. Okay. So so you led right into the next question, which it was um, it, it, what the, uh, what they asked is something you answered. Is there any data regarding the average age of those affected by a transformation? What I'm wondering is. Do you, do you need to take the average onset of the dub of, of WM standard age and put it to the um, transformation since um, to, to kind of get the true picture? Because when it says when people are, you know, when you have the transformation, typically, um, we first have to look at when does WM, what is the WM onset age and how many years, you know, does that make sense? Right. I didn't say that very articulately. No, I apologize for I throwing that I, at you. <laughs> I think I understand your question. I, I just think there's so few people under the age of 50 that there's no collection, no hard data to look at. Okay, that's super helpful. 
that's very helpful because it's one of those things that um, when people are first getting educated, you know, they're not only looking at WM, but they're looking at all everything around it because they're kind of scouring websites and, you know, getting through. And um, when it gets piled on, especially for those who are young, uh, it can get scarier and scarier to think about what happens over time. So this ask, is helpful. Uh, Dr. Kwok, though, since since this this issue is is very similar, whether it's follicular lymphoma or water storms, uh, Dr. Mary, do you know if there's any data about that question in follicular? Do there are people who are diagnosed with follicular at a young age, or they is their risk for transformation any different to your knowledge? Um, as far as I know, I don't know of age-related um, causes. I mean, you know, when there's a transformation, usually what we think happens is, um, you know, the cancer cells take on another mutation that then changes it from just being a cancer that slowly grows to something that not only um, rapidly grows, but also, you know, some of the difficulties that we have when there are transformed lymphomas is that the cancer grows rapidly, but also that the cells don't it, die as easily. We call that apoptosis, right? So we have yeah. like two issues. That's what happens um, um, rather than just like one problem that's developing into the lymphoma. And so that's what makes it hard to um, treat. And like Dr. Libby said, um, transformed lymphomas just sometimes behave differently. Like sometimes they do involve like um, areas outside the lymph nodes, like the brain and things like that, um, more commonly than de novo diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Hmm. But yeah, I'm not sure if there's an age correlation. No. Okay. Okay, I have another two linked questions, and then uh, we have a big Neil question as well in the chat. Um, is there any data linking transformation to past or current treatments? A lot of folks um, think of transformation and say, okay, the guilty culprit is the treatment that I had to address my WM. And I wanna, you know, does is that linkage appropriate? Is it rational? Should we be thinking that way? And is there any research that's been done on the lowest chemo dosageness for dosages for effectiveness um, in order to decrease transformation? Or, or is it just over time this happens looking at? Um, well, the culprit, the, the one drug that is, uh, has been implicated specifically is fludarabine and transformation. So fludarabine uh, does cause uh, mutational changes in the cancer cells and in normal cells. And there are, there are, there has been a suggestion that people who were treated with fludarabine, which for those of you who are newer to on the WM scene, that was a drug that was widely used for lymphoma, but it no it now is I think pretty rarely used. Um, so it because it it uh, injures in the, at the genetic level lymphoma cells, it, it may have a relationship to increasing your risk for um, transformation. That's that's the one main culprit that's been noted in the literature. Um, mm -hmm. Other drugs, bendamustine also affects gen your uh, chromosomes. So uh, it is not usually blamed, but it, it certainly could be. I, I think bendamustine has been given so much in lymphoma, in, in, in other lymphomas like follicular lymphoma. And I, I, don't, I haven't read, heard of a signal that it's been a major culprit in follicular lymphoma transforming that I would tend to say I'm not worried about bendamustine, but fludarabine is the one that clearly has been implied. Mm -hmm. and Thank you. Something we can do to reverse it, to undo having gotten fludarabine yeah. 15 years ago or 20 years ago. So mm -hmm. we just simply have to watch. Um, your other question was, uh, what was that? Um, if there was a lowering the dosages, um, lowest chemo dosageness for effectiveness without getting risk of transformation. But if it's only flu, I, I don't know if there's other drugs that yeah, are connected. Yeah, no, no, not, yeah. there's no data about that. Okay. No. Um, and since we're playing the blame game, which is, is a terrible game to play, but um, here we are in causation. Everybody always wants to know why me. Um, I thought maybe Dr. Kwok could answer this one. Um, if you receive, oh, sorry. Um, Sorry, guys, <laughs> my chat is bouncing. Any evidence on causation of being Neil, or is it random and unknown about why would somebody transform? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. I get that type of question all the time in the clinic too, but I don't think we know. Yeah, um, like um, 
for instance, going back to lymphoma, like we know that sometimes people are at higher risk for CNS involvement if they have um, disease that's in their bone marrow, but we know that Wolfram's is almost always in the bone marrow, right? Um, or um, in protected sites in the body like testicular lymphomas and things like this. Waldenstrom's is different than that and being Neil is different. And so I don't think that that's the same pattern and I'm not sure that we know for sure. Hmm. Okay. One of the things I find fascinating about being Neil is that, and it, uh, Dr. Kwok pointed that out in our slides, but it, it's something you could overlook is that you can find technically being Neil in patients, they have the Waldenstrom cells in the fluid around their brains, but they're completely asymptomatic. So mm -hmm. we, we, we don't treat those people. So I don't know that anyone say taken 100 asymptomatic Waldenstrom's patients and done a spinal tap in all of them and seen how many people actually have some of these cells floating around in their CSF. It's very weird. That's not true with other lymphomas. If there's a bad cell there, you, you've got to treat. So it's very interesting. Maybe WM patients, many can live in harmony with just a few of them around, but some of them will injure the brain and then cause brain dysfunction and confusion, trouble swallowing, speaking, using your arms, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, at the end of the q and I'm gonna ask you to put up the don't worry, be happy slide again, because we're getting some things in the chat from folks who said, yikes, I had, Fluid Aravine five cycles 18 years ago. Uh oh. So um, we're going <laughs> to, Anita, you're going to be okay. <laughs> we're with you. Um, but uh, it's um, important for all of us to know that today, you know, is a difficult conversation because we're talking about kind of worst case scenarios. And again, these are very rare and um, we're not expecting, you know, that, that to change whatsoever. We just want our support group leaders to um, know when people come to you with these complications, what it is that is out there and for you to know for your WM as well. Um, um, Bob asks that if you receive RCHOP for DCBL and then you get a complete response, is it possible to still have WM and to still require treatment? Yeah, this is a, a wonderful subject. Uh, yeah. It's again, very, it's what's weird about WM. So you can get this second lymphoma. We can give you RCHOP or a stem cell transplant to get rid of the transformation. You can be cured of the transformation but the WM is still there. Uh -huh. Usually, if you get RCHOP or you get a stem cell transplant to get, or RCHOP and a stem cell transplant to get rid of the transformation, that's gonna knock the WM out for years and years and years, mm -hmm. but it will not cure it. So it's very interesting. You have two lymphomas then, but we can, the, we can cure the transform, the diffuse large B cell in, in some patients. So weird, weird disease. Hmm, interesting. Okay, moving in a different uh, direction. Can you explain the difference between an irreversible BTK inhibitor and one that is reversible? I'll ask Mary to do that. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Quag, you're going to do the heavy lifting on this one? Um, we can pass. Yeah. Well, I think generally when we think about drugs that are reversible versus irreversible, it talks about the binding, right? So, um, like how uh, does it bind to its target on the cancer cell? Um, like an older example is like Velcade versus Carfilzomib, right? Um, Velcade is one that's a reversible binding um, to the myeloma cell in, in the world of myeloma, or I guess we use it in a lot of other cancers too. Um, but Carfilzomib is an irreversible binder. So when it, once it tags, it holds on to its target. And mm -hmm. so, um, to be honest, I don't know uh, specifically, I'm not prepared to answer this question for BTK inhibitors, but I would suspect it's the same. I mean, that's usually the approach that's taken in a lot of drug design. <clears throat> and the, so the, and part of the issue is if you have, so you, if you have your, uh, your receptor here on the outside of the, of the cell, and, and so if, if this hand, my left hand, and this hand is the receptor on the outside of the cell, and then the drug comes in and binds now to the receptor and causes the change that, that kills or injures the bad cell. Either it can be stuck permanently until the cell is dead and falls apart, or uh, that's, that's irreversible. It binds to its receptor on the outside of the cell and it never leaves until the cell is ground into dust, falls apart. Or 
there are other drugs that bind to the receptor for say 30 minutes and then they come off. Mm -hmm. But even in that uh, even in that short period of time, they cause the the they for instance they give control over the cancer cell. Um, the irreversible uh, drugs that are irre uh, irreversibly bind tend to have more side effects, mm -hmm. and drugs that reversibly mm -hmm. bind. Uh, have less side effects. And so some of the new BTK inhibitors are uh, are reversible, reversible inhibitors. They bind, they control the cell or kill the cell, and, and then they unbind, and there's a lower uh, level of side effects. Okay, cool. We have um, just a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to see if we can, should we do shooting gallery? Should we do just like really quick answer ones to try and get through everybody's, or would you rather triage? Would that be okay to try? <laughs> Yes. Couple of minutes, just a couple of minutes. Yes, we'll do. Uh, okay. okay. So yes. if both myeloma cells and Waldenstrom cells start in the bone marrow, why does myeloma wander and WM not wander? Which is an interesting question. Um, just, just different types of cells. Uh, some have the property to move around and some don't. Okay, great. And then we've got a question from Sweden that I wanted to pull up here. Does Bing Neal affect the white mass in the brain? So um, I don't know that there's like one distinct pattern, right, for um, how Bing Neal affects the brain. We know that it can affect um, any part of the parenchyma. Um, in the literature, I think there's only 50 cases reported. And so that doesn't obviously capture everybody in the world. Um, but it, it can be in any part. So theoretically, any part of the CNS can be involved. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you so much, doctor. Um, Eileen, I, I see you in the chat with your WSM certainly do wander and love to know why I'm so special. I, I like that. Um, um, so I wanted to ask Steve Pine's question, and then we have a familial question, and then we're going to cut it off at that so our doctors can go on with their busy days. Um, can a non-binding kill more than one cancer cell? Yes, yeah, so it could it could come off of the first cell and, and cir circulate to another cell. Yes. Okay. Then we now we have a familial question, and you can say pass, uh, but it'll it'll set me up to uh, ask the group if they'd like uh, uh, to hear a little bit about familial WM at a future meeting. This person asks a very personal question about their own circumstances, which we generally do not ask you to weigh in on. So I'm going to like back up and just kind of go big picture and and just talk about familial. But they ask. Here's a case of someone who has a mother who had WM. The dad had CLL with a transfer, a 51-year-old brother with DBLC, all deceased. And then I have WM and myelofibrosis. What are my chances of transformation? Mm -hmm. So and really complicated uh, family I, history. I, I figured I, that was I the answer. It's any different than what we've shown you so far. Right, exactly. I knew that was the answer, but I just wanted the person to know that, that um, to hear that. Thank you so much, doctors. Um, I have one, the last question to wrap us up, which is the question that I ask every rock star physician who comes and meets with us. So thank you both for answering this question, the final one, which is what is the one thing that you each wish that every WMR new today because standing behind all of the folks you see here our volunteer leaders are hundreds of patients on their email list and in their support group meetings and connected to them and they're able to get the message out so if there's one thing about wm and i know that this your message would probably change if i asked you tomorrow or in six months from now but for right here and right now what's the one thing you think every wm patient should know uh, well I the first thing that came to my mind is for people who don't know about the foundation, they would huge ben benefit. So getting the word out to those folks who don't know about this is would be a tremendous help to every one of you who already know about it. You're you've got such a leg up on, and there's a lot of people who just don't know or they're afraid to look on the website or they don't use the computer. Um, what would I say? Uh, you should make sure you see a Waldenstrom specialist. That's the one thing, at least once. Uh, and anytime your disease is changing, but anytime you need to be treated or the treatment needs to change, see a WM specialist if you possibly can. 
Mm, thank you so much, Dr. Libby. Dr. Kwok, what about you? You had a couple of minutes there to think about it while he was answering. Yeah, no, this is such a great question. And like, I was ha having a hard time, like coming it's up. It's a hard one. With what one thing I would want people to know. Yeah. Um, I guess this would be something that I would encourage, like all um, cancer patients to consider is consider clinical trials, um, mm, which is not awesome. something that people come into the clinic, like thinking about right. or even um, excited about. Um, but I think that, you know, we're in an era where, uh, chemotherapy is being challenged in when it comes to Waldenstrom's and yet, you know, like after BTK inhib inhibition, like there's still big questions about what should come next. And so those are the kinds of things that help, um, I think not only the patient that's being treated, but the other patients with WM. And so I would say that's probably the thing they haven't thought about that I would want them to know. Yeah. Oh, these these were great. Thank you. These were phenomenal answers, and we will spread the word. This oh, Doctor Libby has another one. Going to uh, add to it. Say something whenever we finish. Say one thing. But I'll, what I was <laughs> going to just say, and is that regarding some, you know, having received a drug, maybe pludarabine in the past, or mm. how much should I worry about getting transformation? It's. It, I really think the best way to think of it is like driving your car. Just most of us do drive now and again, so. There may have been a wintry day where it was icy and snowy and you said, well, I, I've got to go pick my husband up from the hospital. You took some risk, you had, but you had to, you know, you're, you, so you had Waldstrom's, there weren't any other great treatments. You took a food therapy and it was the best treatment of the time and you move on. Yeah. Um, so it's That's like in the car, we take risks every day or getting on the bus or whatever. And we live with those risks. And, um, and I, absolutely the last thing I wanted to do and the, we want to do in the world is alarm people. It's, it's in information, uh, right. in for being, uh, knowledgeable is power. Mm. Dr. Libby, what a phenomenal note to end on because a, I don't know what we're going to do when you retire because you truly are a fan favorite of the WM community. And, um, there is no one who educates us, um, so masterfully and does it in such a calm and reassuring and really supportive way, which is uh, a tremendous gift, uh, to every patient and caregiver. I really truly mean that. Thank you so much for teaching us about blood labs for every, everything you've ever stood up in front of the IW IMF, you know, community and taught us about. Um, we're so grateful uh, that we have a lot of those sessions recorded. And we are, of course, assuming that you're going to be throwing your cell phone number in the chat before you leave so that we can reach you after that last day, because we're not we're not ready to let you go. We're, we want to thank you wholeheartedly for that fabulous conversation today, um, because we learned so much. And we're so grateful for everything that you've done every single day of your career and the invaluable, tireless work of your hands and your heart to help uh, really improve the lives of uh, WMers worldwide. And so I'm glad that this is our first uh, global meeting here of uh, volunteer leaders so that we could thank you from around the world for everything that you did during your career um, to help uh, out us in our lives and our chronic disease. We're very, very grateful. And uh, we extend warmest thanks to you both for being here and spending time with us this afternoon and educating us um, so masterfully. Thank you. Thank you with the bottom of my heart. Yes, feel free to unmute yourselves and clap. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. And thank you, so, Hans, for hosting us and supporting us. <laughs> thank you so much, doctors. We're really very grateful. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.